Hi, I'm Andy Jones, content editor for Plaid's online education program, Let's Paint. And today, we're going to paint an apple. Just like the old saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, painting an apple a day is the painter's way. So come on, let's paint. All right, today we're gonna to show you how to paint a nice, bright, red, juicy apple. And this is the apple that we have uh, as part of the Let's Paint kit, and you'll have a nice, beautiful photograph of this apple. But I wanted to take a moment and show you how you can paint on other things. This was a large carved wooden bowl that I found at a craft shop, and I painted a similar design of apples on this. So you can see that these apples are painted on a stained background, and I'm going to show you the really interesting copper background that we're going to paint on today. But just wanted to show you that you can paint on other things, so don't have just one idea stuck in your mind. Always be looking around, seeing that things are interesting, or, you know, the possibilities of painting on a different surface are all around you. So this is a, a nice example of painting on a wooden surface and then painting on uh, the copper surface. Just going to clear the decks here. In today's tutorial, I'm going to show you how we paint it on this copper tooling foil. It's very easy to find. You can order it online. Simply search for a copper tooling foil. It comes on a roll and it's very thin and you can cut it with scissors to whatever size that you want. Now, to achieve this uh, verdigris finish, I like to use a commercial patina solution. And again, it's accessible online. So I have some in a cup, and it's a liquid. You don't have to do anything with it. Just simply rub it on the surface, and you can see that it already starts to chemically change the way the copper looks. So that's really all there is to the background. You're just going to dab the solution on, you let it dry, and it changes to this verdigris finish. If you think about the Statue of Liberty being green, this is exactly the same chemical reaction that has occurred there. So put it on, let it dry, look at it. If you're not happy with it, you can come back and simply add some more and you'll get a reaction in a different place or a stronger reaction in other places and then let that completely dry and you will end up with a surface that has the verdigris finish on it and you can see that I've transferred my design using white transfer paper and I've already undercoated my leaves using sap green that'll just save us some time later on in the tutorial. So we're going to start by focusing on that bright red apple and I'm going to put the paint I need for the apple out onto my palette now. I'm going to need naphthol crimson. I'm going to need pure orange. And I'm using original folk art acrylic. I'm going to need true burgundy. I'm going to need sap green. I'm going to need medium yellow. I'm going to need lemon yellow. Lots of pretty colors going into this apple. I'm going to need some aqua. And it looks like a lot of colors. Probably as many colors go into this single apple as I use in a whole painting. Need a little Persian blue. I'm going to need some titanium white. All right, so let's get started painting. I'm going to take a flat brush. I'm going to make sure that it's nicely shaped, getting any of the excess moisture out of my brush. And I'm going to load the brush with naphthol crimson. And notice that I always pull the paint away from the main puddle into what I like to call a loading zone so that I can bounce the brush up and down, which spreads the bristles out. And then when they snap back, they pull the paint up into the brush 
so that I can get the brush full of paint in order to undercoat my apple. So I'm going to move my palette back. I'm going to bring my apple in close. And always remember, and you'll see me doing this all through the tutorial, you want to turn your apple so that it's comfortable for you to paint. Now, remembering your basic brush strokes that you learned, I'm going to begin to fill in the apple. And I want to make sure that I keep a nice, crisp edge because apples do not have a fuzzy edge. So you want to make sure that it's nice and smooth around the outside. Just continuing to turn the apple as I paint. And if the texture of this uh, vertigree finish gets in your way, you can always go back the other direction. Please make sure to always cover your transfer lines because there's nothing worse than having a nice painting and then seeing those transfer lines. Again, move the painting so that it's comfortable for you and keep that nice, sharp outside edge covering those transfer lines, and then using a padding motion, you just want to fill in the entire apple, except for this area right behind uh, where the stem joins the apple. You want to kind of leave that unpainted because we want our yellow to be bright, and it'll be easier for the yellow to go over the green background, that light green background, than it will be our dark red naphthol crimson. So just patting this color on. Reds and yellows are notorious for not covering in one coat, um, so sometimes you might have to add a second coat to get really nice opaque coverage, and that's perfectly fine. You're not doing anything wrong if you need to add a second coat of paint to your apple. But if you do need to add a second coat, you need to make sure that your first coat is thoroughly dry so that you don't end up digging a hole in the paint. So I'm just going to carry this around. All right. And now, if you're painting along with me, you can pause the video at this point, let this base coat dry, and if necessary, you can add a second coat. Okay. So, now you have undercoated your apple with naphthol crimson and it's thoroughly dry. And we're going to now apply the shading on the dark side of the apple. And I'm going to use a really big flat brush because I'm very comfortable using large brushes. Um, you might not want to use a brush as large as I'm using. You might want to use, I don't know, a 12 or a 14 brush. Don't use a little brush. Never send a boy to do a man's job. A big brush, there's plenty of room in this apple for this brush. So I'm going to side load this brush with true burgundy. And I want to make sure that I've got a good amount of paint in my brush. And I sneak up to the paint, bouncing the brush, and then move to a loading zone. If I need my paint to be more fluid, I touch the brush to water, but I want you to always touch the corner of the brush that has paint in it into the water. That way you don't pick up just water all over the brush. You really want to make that paint more fluid. So corner of the brush into the water, then blot on your paper towel and back to your loading zone. Want to pick up some more paint. Want to make sure that paint is fluid touch my brush onto my paper towel, and then back into my loading zone. And it seems like I'm gearing up for a big important step, and I am, and it's going to be really quick and easy to do because my brush is properly loaded and is full of paint. All right, so turning my surface so that it's comfortable for me, and this is going to be the dark side of the apple, and I'm basically going to paint a C-stroke on the apple. What's a C-stroke? 
It's a stroke that you need to master with your flat brush, and we have a skill builder on flat brush strokes that you can refer back to for more detailed instructions on that. But we're going to touch the brush onto the surface, putting the dark color to the outside edge. I'm going to slide and I'm going to press and add the dark shading onto the apple and lift back up I'm going to pick up some more paint and I'm going to repeat this and I'm going to pat and move that shading further up into the apple. And at this point I need to stop and I need to let this dry before I go back and reinforce the dark shadow on the apple. All right, so I've applied my first shading onto the apple, which was just true burgundy, and I've carried that out. My brush is still loaded with the true burgundy and water. I'll touch the brush to the water, blot on my paper towel, come back into my loading zone, and I want to pick up some more burgundy. And now to darken this, I want to pick up some sap green on the same side of the brush, and then work that into my loading zone. And if you mix true burgundy and sap green with a palette knife, you're going to make a really nasty brown color, and it's not interesting or exciting. You want to pick up the two colors on your brush so that you get this really beautiful gradation from super dark over to clear. Again, touch my brush to water, blot on my paper towel, and again, back into the loading zone. Before I put this on, I want to mention another tip, um, and that is the position of my water basin and my paper towel to the palette. I'm a right-handed painter, so I have my water basin, then in front of it I have my paper towel, and then just to the left of it I have my palette. And I always work with this configuration so that it becomes second nature and becomes muscle memory to touch the water, touch the paper towel, and then go to the palette. And you'll see me doing that over and over and over when I paint. It, if you set yourself up the same way every time, then you never have to wonder where your water is, where's the paper towel, where's the paint on my palette. You've got it the same place all the time. All right, so turning my work around, remember your work is never nailed into place. You can always move it so that it's comfortable for you. I'm going to add just a little bit more sap green because I want this to be super dark. And we're going to start and we're just going to really really reinforce this dark shading. And you might be able to do it in one pass, but I think if you need to apply it twice, that's perfectly fine. And then it's just this great dark color. And just to reinforce this, if you don't have really dark shading, then your highlights will never appear as bright. So for as light as you want your highlights to be, you have to have shadows that are equally as dark. So now that my apple has water all over it from where I applied the shading, once again we need to pause the video so that we can dry this um, shading before we start to apply our highlights. So if you're painting along with me, this is a good place to pause your video apply that dark shading, let it dry, and then come back and we'll continue developing the highlights on the apple. Okay, we have successfully applied very dark shading to our apple. I think it looks fantastic. It's now dry and we can start to um, develop our highlights on the apple and also create the dimensional part of the apple where the stem joins the fruit. So I think we're going to start back there. I'm going to turn this apple around and I'm going to pick up some medium yellow and we're going to fill this area in and I want to use brush strokes to follow the curve of that area of dimension and we'll do the same thing over on this side. It's almost like a strange little yellow mustache there and then we need to put a little bit more yellow on there up a little bit more 
and then just kind of soften that up a little bit. And I'm going to let that dry and we're going to start to develop the highlights on the front portion of the apple. Wipe that yellow out of my brush. I'm going to pick up some naphthol crimson, move to a clean area on the palette, load my brush with a sparse amount of paint. I'm going to come over and take the excess paint off on my paper towel. And what I'm doing with this first layer of highlighting is basically I'm just softening some red back into my shading. And I do this because, as you can see, this is kind of raggedy, and that's perfectly fine. And if you put yours on and you're not sure about how you've side-loaded and gotten that on there, this is a perfect opportunity to kind of clean up and correct anything that may be not exactly the way you want it. So once again, light pressure, sparse amount of paint, and you can see as we zoom in here that we have just lightened and softened the edge of the shadow by feathering on some of the undercoat color. And you can see where it's collected a little bit on the texture, and that's exactly what you want to have happen. So continuing on, just softening over that shading, and now you've created, you haven't really blended anything, but you have the optical effect of having blended the dark burgundy into the red. So I'm going to wipe my brush off, pick up a little bit of the naphthol crimson and some pure orange, and I'm going to brush mix these together because I want to have a lighter color than my naphthol crimson. Take the excess paint off on my paper towel, and I'm going to begin where I want my highlight to be the brightest, which is right over here in the upper left quadrant of the apple. So I'm going to touch the brush down, and I want you to make sure that you can see this first little glimmer of a highlight starting. It should be lighter than the red of the apple, but not jarring. So just touch that down, and you can see that that's a nice lighter value. I want to make sure that I don't have an excess amount of paint on my brush. So we're just going to begin to feather this color out not going as far over, I went with the naphthol crimson over there, but with this first highlight color, I'm probably only going to go that far. So each layer covers a slightly smaller area. I am going to come all the way out to the edge over here. And I'm going all the way to the left or the light side of the apple with this same light color. So I want to make sure that I get the highlight going all the way over there because it's lighter. I keep picking up just a little bit of pure orange, mixing it in, taking the excess paint off of my brush, and now I want to make sure that I lighten the area in the front of the point of dimension. Just feathering that color on, because this would be lighter. Okay, now we've successfully done that first layer. Now the next layer, I'm just going to pick up more pure orange, brush mix that in, take the excess paint off on my paper towel so I have a very sparse amount of paint, and I'm going to again start in this area, touch that down. I can see that that color is slightly lighter, but it's not a dramatic value change, which is good, and then just feather that color out, covering a smaller area. And the first few highlights, I'll be honest with you, not very exciting. Doesn't look like much is happening, but you have to develop this foundation or your apple won't look beautiful when you're finished. So again, just skimming this on letting some of the texture in the background do some of the work for me. Now, here's where we're going to start to see some big changes. Picking up some medium yellow and coming into the same loading zone, lightening that orangey color with some yellow. Take the excess paint off my brush, sparse amount of paint, and then I want to touch that down, and I see that that's lighter in value. It's not jarring. And we're then just going to feather this color out, covering a smaller area, 
than we did with the previous color. Now, hopefully you can see that we, our first highlight was carried all the way over to here. Then we've progressively covered smaller areas, getting lighter in value. That's what I want running through your head when you're doing this. Lighter in value, smaller in area. So I'm going to pick up some more yellow. And I had orange in my brush so that you can see when I just pick up yellow, it's already toned down. Take the excess paint off my brush. Start where I want my highlight to be the brightest. You can see that this is slightly lighter in value. And we're going to cover a slightly smaller area. And you can start to see that by changing the value, we're creating form in the apple. At least I hope you can see that. So again, more medium yellow. Taking the excess paint off of my brush. Just sparse amount of paint. I'm going to start where I want my highlight to be the brightest, touch it down. Yes, I can see that there's a difference. It's not jarring to my eye, so I can continue on. I'm going to feather that paint out to a smaller area. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit of lemon yellow with this. Again, you can see I'm just lightening the value slightly, covering a smaller area each time. Needed a little bit more of the lemon yellow there. Just pick it up, take the excess paint off my brush, touch the brush to the surface, and you can see that these lighter highlights are, go on much, much faster because they cover a smaller and smaller and smaller area. Now, I'm going to wipe my brush thoroughly on my paper towel, and I like to put the brush down, fold the paper towel over, and pull the brush through so that I've groomed it back to a nice flat edge going to pick up some of the lemon yellow and I want this to be more bright so I'm not going to be mixing it in there. I want this to kind of stand alone. Very sparse amount of paint on my brush. Touch the brush down. Uh, maybe need just a little bit more paint. Always have to pay attention to what you've got going on on your brush. So brighter, lighter yellow. And you can see how we're really building up to this dramatic highlight. I'm going to take a little titanium white oh, and now flip my brush over so I've got some strange orange in there. So I'm just going to wipe my brush off on my paper towel again. Pick up some titanium white. Very sparse amount of paint on my brush. Take the excess off on my paper towel and just start where I want that highlight to be the brightest. Skim a little bit of that on. Notice that it didn't take any time and what a tremendous difference that little bit of white makes. So wipe the paint off my brush again. Once again, pick up some titanium white. And I think this is probably going to be as bright as I can get this highlight. I want to take the excess paint off my brush, very sparse amount of paint. And we're just going to lay in the brightest highlight there. So we've gone from naphthol crimson through orange, through medium yellow, through lemon yellow, and then finally a little bit of titanium white. And just for grins, I'm going to take a little bit of extra white on my brush. I'm not going to wipe it off on my paper towel, but you can see there's not much white there. And I'm just going to lay on the brightest little white highlight there. Wow, it's a lot of work, but it went fast, and you see how quickly we've developed a round, beautiful apple there. Now, back to the point of dimension. I'm going to pick up a little bit more medium yellow and a little bit of lemon yellow together. I'm going to turn this around and I'm just going to come back and brighten that point of dimension there. And I'm going to pick up a speck of aqua on my brush and a little bit of lemon yellow mix those together to make a nice lime green color. If you've ever looked down into some apples, you can see that it goes from red down to yellow and a little bit of green down in the bottom. So I'm going to brush a little bit of that on down in there, carry it out just a little bit. Then I'm going to take this same green color and over on the light side of the apple, we're going to work in a few little green streaks 
So I've got a, a don't have much paint on my brush, but there's enough paint to drag off a little bit of a green streak over here. So right along the edge, and then we're just going to kind of zigzag back and forth, developing a little bit of a green tinge over there. Going to pick up some more yellow and aqua. And I'm going to put this color back at the point of dimension of the apple. So it's just a little darker color there. And I'm going to take that same color and we're going to go over to the light side of our apple again. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of moving back and forth a little quick there. But you can see the difference. And then I'm just going to add some more of this green over here. I'm going to lighten that color up with some lemon yellow. And come over here. And again, not much paint on the brush, but just zigzag back and forth. A little bit of a green streak on the apple, because lots of apples have these beautiful colored streaks in there. So we've got that done. Now, pick up a tiny bit of Persian blue. You can see how dramatically blue-green that made it. And so I'm going to turn this upside down. And right down in the very, very bottom of this point of dimension, I'm going to add some of that stronger blue-green color and just let some of that sneak up a little bit. And that's what we do to paint a nice, bright, red, juicy apple. So at this point, you can pause your video, you can catch up, keep um, adding your highlights, and then when we come back, I'm going to show you how to paint an apple leaf. You've done a great job uh, developing the highlights on your apple and now it's all dry. And I'm going to teach you how to paint a leaf and the stems and a little cast shadow. So as I mentioned earlier, our leaves have been undercoated with sap green and I'm going to rinse out a flat brush and I'm also going to add some pure black onto my palette because with every color that I've put out there, can't believe I didn't put some black out, but we have that now. So my brush has red in it that I undercoated the apple with, so I'm going to just neutralize the brush by picking up some sap green and then wiping the brush out. I will rinse the brush, blot on my paper towel, and now I'm going to side load the brush with some sap green and some pure black. Notice that I sneak into the side of the pile of paint. You'll almost never see me jab the corner of my brush into a puddle of paint. I don't think you can really see and understand the amount of color that you're putting on your brush when you do that. But if you go in from the side, you're always in the driver's seat. You can always see what you've done. All right, so now I have my brush with this very, very dark shading green on it and I'm going to shade at the bottom of my leaf, or in this case over here, where one leaf goes behind the apple. So I'm going to just begin patting the shading on at the base of the leaf, and then just kind of pat and work that color out into the leaf. All right, now I'm just going to take a paper towel and I'm just going to blot that a little bit so that that is pretty dry and I'm going to begin to develop the highlights on our leaf. So I'm going to first take some sap green and not use much paint on my brush. My brush is dry because we're going to be developing the highlights using a dry brush technique. So if you've got water in your brush that's going to be wet so you know you don't want that because a wet brush can't do a dry brush technique. So wipe the excess paint out of my brush, pick up a sparse amount of the sap green, and I'm just going to feather some of this on and soften back into that black. And I'm not sure if you can see it real clear, but you can see where the green kind of feathers and softens into that black just a little bit. 
that's what I call cleaning up my shading. And usually my first layer of highlight is doing nothing but cleaning up the shading. So now to develop the highlights I'm going to use some sap green and some medium yellow and I'm just going to brush mix these together. I want to create a lighter green and I want this to be just slightly lighter than my leaf's undercoat. So wipe the excess paint off of my brush. Remember it's a dry brush technique so we don't want any excess paint on the brush and I'm going to gently create the center vein of the leaf and then I'm going to the lighter or higher side of the vein of the leaf is where the highlights going to be the brightest so I'm going to begin to scrub that lighter green on and then feather that color out. I need to add a little bit more of the medium yellow and it probably got way too light but I can pick up some of the dark green and this is kind of a cool thing about brush mixing your colors you get all these variations so that when you're painting a number of leaves or any sort of thing that has uh, multiple elements to it you'll always have some slight variation in what you do so again start where I want that to be the brightest and I'm just feathering that color out and I'm going to come to the opposite side of the leaf because I want this to look like a depression there. So my highlight's going to be brighter on the outside edge of the leaf, fading in toward this um, kind of cleft in the leaf. So add a little bit more yellow. Take the excess paint off your brush. Check your highlight. Just make sure the color's good. Feather it out, covering a smaller area. Reaching over here to the other side to get that highlight going over there. And you can see pretty quickly that this already starts to look a whole lot like a leaf. So I'm just adding more medium yellow. Take the excess paint off on my paper towel. Start where I want that highlight to be the brightest. Covering a smaller area. Just feather that color out just a little bit less than you did before. Reach over to the other side of the leaf. Apply the highlight over there. Going to add a little bit of lemon yellow to this. And because lemon yellow has a good amount of white actually in the paint, you're going to notice that this highlight's going to be brighter. Take the excess paint off my brush. And it really does look like I have no paint on there, but I have plenty of paint for the small highlight. Feathering it out a smaller area. Reach across the leaf. Get the highlight out at that side. Adds a little bit more lemon yellow. Cover a smaller area. You can see how I'm just building that highlight up. And a little bit more lemon yellow. Just pay attention to what you're doing. You'll suddenly hear my voice in your head. Sparse amount of paint on your brush. No, no, that's too much paint. Get rid of that excess. So I've added a little bit of white and much smaller highlight there. All right, that's all the highlighting that that leaf needs, but it does need to have a vein in there. So I'm going to take my number two script liner brush and I'm going to pick up well, all of that's dry. So we're going to go back to the big puddles of paint, pick up some sap green, pick up a little bit of lemon yellow, and I'm just going to mix these together, add a little bit of titanium white, and I'm going to use my liner brush in very thin paint. See, it's just ink-like consistency. Now I want to show you another little tip that you might not think of where I've dipped my brush in water. There's a little bead of water right here at the end of the ferrule as where it joins the bristles. And to get rid of that, simply take your brush and touch where the ferrule and the bristles come together onto your paper towel and you see that little bit of color come off. It's important 
to always check that. If that bead is there and you go to your surface, sometimes when you touch the tip of your brush down, that water just travels right down the bristles and you'll end up with a blob of paint where you don't really want it. All right, now back to our reg regularly scheduled instructions. I'm going to take this color and I'm going to simply paint in a light vein and then a few little side veins onto the leaf. We're not painting a bunch of them, but just a few, just to show that there are some veins in the leaf. All right, you would paint each of your leaves using the same exact technique and the same color. I don't think I need to show you all of those in the video, but I do wanna show you how to paint the stem. And of course, I've lost where my stems have gone on this. So I want to take my drawing and I want to position it back over my painting. And we stuck pretty much to that. That's very good. And then I want to use a piece of white transfer paper, which is what I transferred my design to the surface with. And I need to, uh, it's coming off on my hand, so I know now that this is the back, this is the good side of the transfer paper. So it goes down and then you just lay your pattern back on top. You could use a stylus or in this case, I've got a ballpoint pen here, which works just fine. And I'm just gonna lightly go over my pattern lines just so I can have a good indication of where these stems are. And so when I lift all of this up, you can see that I have my stems back on my painting and I know exactly where I need to paint. So for our stems, I'm going to put out a little bit of uh, burnt umber on the palette. And I'm going to once again pick up my liner brush and I'm going to bring this in so I can get a little bit closer to it. Pick up a little burnt umber. And add more water so that I make this a very fluid, loose consistency. And I'm not going to paint all the stems. I'm just going to paint, give you an idea about how to do them. So using a light touch, I would just simply come in here and paint in the stem and let it trail out into the leaf. So now it looks like the leaf is actually part of the stem. Then I have this bit of a stem coming over here. And there's kind of a, a, it's not really a burl, there's kind of a knuckle, we'll call it, on the stem where your stems that go off and form branches and leaves and the ones that come down and hook onto your apple all come together. And then we've got this little branch that comes over here and goes to that leaf. And so there is the undercoating of our stem. Now, this branch is actually alive because we have live fruit and nice green leaves on it. So I'm going to add some sap green to my uh, burnt umber, thin it down, and I'm gonna dab some of this green on and it's just kind of dabbing it on because these are they're not smooth little stems we want them to have a little bit of texture and interest in there dabbing that on then I'm going to add a little bit of white to this don't want it to be really bright because I just want to highlight this but not make them the star of the painting so then I'm just going to dab on some of these highlights and you instantly get the illusion of a stem and you haven't had to work very hard to do that. If you have practiced with your liner brush and you're comfortable using it, this will be easy. If your paint is the right consistency, your paint must be thin enough to just flow off the bristles of the brush. Now, the last thing I'm gonna show you is probably one of the most important things in this painting and probably something you haven't even really noticed. And that is a little bit of a cast shadow. So I'm picking up some true burgundy 
because I'm going to paint a shadow on the apple. I want this to be nice and thin so that it flows off my brush and I want it to be transparent. So right where this branch is resting on the apple and it's right next to the highlight, I'm going to touch my brush down and I'm simply going to stroke on a cast shadow. I'm going to need to pick up a little bit more color on my brush and we just add this simple little cast shadow and we're also going to add one back here All right, now that looks like solid paint to me, so I'm going to show you a huge trick. I'm going to take my finger, I'm going to blot it, and boom, we've softened that shadow in. If we need to do it over here, we can do that too. And now those cast shadows look like they're actually part of the apple. If I wanted to, I can come back and deepen my true burgundy with a little bit of Persian blue. So now I've got a nice um, red-violet color. And I'm just going to come back and deepen the shadow right next to that stem, carry that color out a little bit, and blot it. Now, to be honest, I'm not thrilled with the way that pointed there, so I'm just going to take a little moisture on my brush, and I'm going to come back and just curve that ever so slightly. Much happier with that. And that, my friends, is how you paint a bright red apple. Painting this apple was a lot of fun. Working on the copper background and the patina made it extra special. I hope you enjoyed painting it as much as I enjoyed teaching it to you. I'd like to invite you to join our group on Facebook, Let's Paint with Plaid. You'll get up to the minute information about the Let's Paint program and be part of an online community of other artists who are part of the program. Please visit plaidonline.com forward slash let's paint to find out more about the Let's Paint program. Information about studio lessons, skill builder videos, Let's Paint Live, and Folk Art One Stroke with Donna Dewberry featuring Flowers of the Month. We'll see you next time.